Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker for the evening. Lebukhang Dipolo Peko. Her areas of research specialization include international trade and international economics in the context of South-North relations. It also includes political economy, regional integration of African states, feminist economics, international development, international relations in relation to African positionality, migration, and globalization. Ms. Peko's work is grounded in a race, class, and feminist and she is committed to grounding academic research in community struggles and praxis. She has taught at universities as a visiting faculty member across South Africa, Sweden, the UK, Zambia, Mexico, and the United States. She is also a member of the Walter and Patricia Rodney Commission on Reparation and is leading the South African chapter on the political economy of reparation. Lebo Khang is also the senior research fellow at Feminist, Activist and Advocacy Think Tank. She is also a Lancet Commissioner on Reparation and an Ambassador of the Wellbeing Economy at Global Alliance. Lebohang takes guidance and inspiration from the her stories of the women who have and continue to resist all forms of imperialism. She is deeply committed to excavating memory and decolonized history that rebel against official narratives. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Lebohang Tipolo Peko to the podium. Sons and daughters of the soil, Azanian children, African people in this southern tip of Africa, one day to be called Azania. I would like to appreciate this institution for having the courage, the vision to participate in voicing the voiceless and in seeing the unseen and remembering the unremembered. I would like to appreciate the Sobukwe family who are present and absent for the tree of knowledge, of wisdom, of courage that they have left us to stand under its shade. I would also like to appreciate the president and the leadership of Ntate Sobukwe's political home, the Pan-Africanist Congress, and the leadership of Azapo. I would also like to appreciate each of us for coming to be part of this meditation, this thinking, this reflection on who we are and who we could be when we consider our circumstances 
within the context of Ndate, Mangaliso, Sobukwe, a wonder, a miracle, a leader of no peer. Dumelang Sanibonani Molweni. The title of this meditation is Defying the Undefiable, a meditation on reparative memory. And this is really to say that because there's so little that has been recorded vocally on Ndate Sobukwe, we are forced to piece together what we imagine influenced him, what we imagine influenced the circumstances of his death of, and of his birth, and what we imagine he may have spoken into the ether of today's context. I begin by saying that on 27 February 1978, a message reached us in that funny little country, that place called Exile. That told us that a giant tree had fallen. I was a tiny child, but I understood that something of significance had occurred and that someone of the greatest stature had been wrought from this life to the next. In this opening meditation, I remind us of the countless speculations that abound over the disappearance of Ntate Sobukwe's archive and his voice. Some argue that the apartheid administration intentionally made sure that there could be no remnant, no detection of the bacteria of Africanism that he had infected the nation and indeed the nations with. Others believe that due to the potential to incite and to insurrect, there had to be a way of ever banishing him not only in life, but in perpetuity. The emancipation of all Africans in South Africa and in what I call global Africa might have been accelerated under the sound of that voice. But the good news is that my Africa, we are here. And for as long as we are here, we can also give voice. You know, in many languages, many African languages, including Sisutu, including Sisulu, when we say Likai, Likai ka Sisutu, people take it to mean, how are you? It means, where are you? Where are you situated? Likai. And then we respond and say, retain. Meaning what? We are here. We are where? We are here. Now you can imagine that if a person's voice is in a void, we have no way of situating where they are, nor of situating where we are. And when we say Sanibonani or Saubona, what are we saying? We see you, we acknowledge you. You are a person, you are an embodied being. That is why we find it as African people offensive. When you just walk in and you just sit, how she nicks. And you ask yourself, am I not a person? Am I not seen? And the ethic of remembrance is accompanied by the political ethic of rehumanizing black people by seeing and by hearing. So by removing and erasing a voice, it means we refuse to see and to hear. But again, we are here to re-embody Ntate Mangali Sosobukwe. He will not be silent whilst we are standing. So the meditation on memory suggests a few things. That memory is a multifaceted idea. It is sometimes fragile. It is often contested. 
It is frequently tainted by power, by position, by positionality, by race, by Eurocentricism. It is often tainted by expediency, by convenience, sometimes by a sense of shame and a quest for glory. And it is related, undoubtedly, to the ones who have the strongest ink. Wars have been reinvented and entire civilizations erased by the stroke of one pen. The most potent parts of a nation's memory are often wielded by those with the most power and the most voice, and clearly, the most ink. There are very instances where recollections of the majority can be assumed to have been considered in official narratives and accounts of how we came to be, how we came to be here, and what actually occurred. But surely memory is an account of things remembered from the past and history being the study of that past. The convergence between memory and history is then a very politicized one. If you've ever heard in a courtroom, people say, okay, what was the witness wearing? No, they were wearing a shirt. Then somebody will say, no, 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 but the shirt was green. But somebody else will say, no, the, the shirt was lemon. No, but somebody else will then say, no, the shirt was lime. Or Muni Uzoti, actually, no, the shirt was gray. Because in J, what is color and what is memory? It is the constellation of our preferences, of our ideation, of our wishes, and sometimes of our comfort levels. So even one account of things can have multiple ways and roots to being remembered. Where we fail as nations is in assuming that there is only one path to recollection and that the one with the most ink is the most reliable path. So here we think about memory as an alive organism, as tangible, as breathing, as being something that we are always in dialogue with, which is why we'll get excited when we hear a new piece of information, because sometimes our history is actually in the future. We find new information. We find different narratives. We find different approaches, which cause us to look backwards completely differently, in a fresh way. So where memory is living and tangible, particularly where the events are relatively proximate, like settler colonial apartheid, like the Gulf War, like the Rwandan genocide, there is a greater space to wrestle between multiple stories. And this is where the reparative aspect must come into play. When we speak of reparative memory, we don't only repair the single path, we prepare a path for multiple possibilities. In this instance, memory is an ethical position. It is a space and a place where we wrestle with the best idea of who we imagine we are and challenged sometimes by the hard truths of our actions. Now, the colonial question offers many examples and opportunities for people and nations to explore multiple narratives. And this typology of colonial narratives has been divided between paternalistic colonial apologetics that suggest that the roads and the schools that the empires left behind were some kind of a compensation for illegal and immoral land occupation, acts of genocide, and the amputation of entire cultures and memories of nations. Will we allow Intate Prof Sobukwe to be part of that amputation for any longer? Will we continue to allow him to be part of the erasure of our memory? Will we continue to allow him and Mezon Deni Sobukwe to continue in banishment even beyond this life? So because of the challenges of finding that the Prof's 
voice and his ability to say Likai for himself, it falls upon us and occasions like this to try and situate him. So we have to design a quasi-fictional Ndatesobukwe under these circumstances. We imagine an Ndatesobukwe to preserve his ideas and assure their relevance to our current struggles. This, well, this we know. We know that he was born in Hrafrinet, like our DVC here, Mkayawake. We know that he was the youngest child of Ndate Hubert and Angelina Sobukwe. We know that his father was from Lesotho, who worked as a general store clerk and a part-time wood cutter. And we know that Ndate Sobukwe's mother, Me Angelina, or Queen Mother Angelina, was a domestic worker in European homes. On the occasion of Ndate Prof's birth in 1924, several things were happening. And I'd like to suggest that none of these things are coincidences in the context of what was in the ether and what was written in the stars of his life. The one was that the Native Urban Areas Act of 1923 had just been passed to enforce segregation in urban residential areas and implemented influx control to limit African people's entry into cities. And by 1926, when Barry Herzog suggested expanding the reserve zones, he had also excluded black voters in the Cape from the common role. Another thing that was happening was that in Johannesburg, the implementation of apartheid colonial segregation had allowed the government to limit investment by treating, by creating uneven living conditions across the city and again ensuring a steady supply of an urban workforce. And this technique was thoroughly uh, part of the implementation of this 1923 Native Urban Areas Act. This voiced opposition from both African residents and landlords, as well as the manufacturing classes, mainly European settlers, who preferred to have Africans stay closer to their workplaces, not at our convenience. The egregious, the egregious nature of this becomes clearer as what we now know to be apartheid spatial planning was entrenched and remains with us. So by the time we fast forward uh, almost 40 years to the Sharpeville and Langa Pass actions, we can see that that was the beginning of the seeds of the rehumanizing of the most dehumanized. Rehumanization is one of the most fundamental projects of reparative memorialization by centering black people's personhood as the primary consideration. To make visible, to make audible, to make tangible the full dimensions of personhood, particularly where imperial lenses have contorted us into whispers and shadows of other people's imagination. Because habariboni, they see as they wish to see there is no okai. It is we think, therefore you are. And in this popular perception, bear in mind as well that 1924 was also considered a significant moment in this settler South African history. Herzog government was, uh, was a white workers' government opposed to the interest of mining capital, and it had been weakened. It did not launch the type of campaign that supporters of the then British Empire were interested in. In fact, Herzog gained power by forming strange alliances with, with what was then the, the British, the Labour Party, the South African Labour Party, who were known in these parts as the English white Bolsheviks, a strange alliance. And although the Labour Party 
was limited under the continuance of union under the British flag as a result of uh, Herzog's Republican leanings. It has to be said that the Unrighteous Pact contains in it the United Party. It also was then the residue of what became a Liberal Party, which is then what became the Progressive Party, which would be an antecedent, a precursor of what is today known as the Democratic Alliance. Ma Africa, far be it for me to prescribe where anybody should place their ex. But please be aware of the ancestral energies that are carried by this movement and their own ongoing manifestations. And some of these ancestral energies include the Balfour Report, as represented by the Committee on Inter-Imperial Relations during the 1926 Imperial Conference in London, which again, um, Um Herzog signed on to. And this revised rela the relationship between Britain, Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and what was called the Irish Free State. And yet, it stated that all its dominions were constitutionally equal. And yet, because history doesn't happen in a vacuum, its predecessor, which was the Balfour Declaration, legitimated settler colonialism in Palestine in 1917, as ratified by the League of Very, Very Despicable Nations in 1922. Please be aware of that ancestral energy. At this same time, there were gatherings of the Pan-Africanist movement and the Pan-African movement throughout the world. So while the imperialists were busy wringing their hands over how to entrench empire, African people were, as always, as we have today, gathering around the world. And the importance of these interwar, and I say that with caution, those were not world wars, those were, of course, European tribal wars, um, but the, in, the importance of those um, inter-European war congresses is largely acknowledged, primarily due to its formal connection with the Fifth Pan-African Congress, but also if we go back to the era around which Ntato Sobukwe was born, there are many scholars that believe that the two congresses were basically maintained of 1921 and 1923 that took place in, in Paris and London, um, were basically uh, the, the concept of an, uh, of, an, of an oppressed group to eliminate discrimination. It also needs to be said that these gatherings had immense influence on liberation movements globally. So we, have, we know about our Du Boises, we know about our Sylvester Williams, we know about our George Padmores and others. As late as 1974, another titan, Walter Rodney, the Guyanese historian adopted by Tanzania, noted that the main goal of Pan-African Congresses before 1945 was just to persuade colonizing powers to act more responsibly, humanely, more lovingly, in their colonial approach. But afterwards, there was a deeply radicalized tone to those congresses. And I'll read what many of them said, um, especially after the epic congress that took place in 1927, organized, by the way, by women like Dora Cole Norman, like Jessie Redman, like Dorothy R. Peterson, because as always, women must be written back into her story and our story. And like the South African scholar earlier on, um, Mae Alice Kinlock from here, Kimberley, 
short left our very own, who was part of the London edition. Um, and what these, uh, the resolutions of the 1927 Congress were, were this, a voice in their, and at the time to coin the, the, the language of the time, Negroes everywhere need a voice in their own government. Native rights to the land and its natural resources. Modern education for all children. The development of Africa for the Africans, not merely for the profit of Europeans. The reorganization of commerce and industry so as to make the main object of capital and labor the welfare of the many rather than the enriching of the few. Did someone say BEE in 1927? The treatment of civilized, they say men, people, as civilized, despite differences of birth or race or color. They might as well have been sitting here next to us in 1924 or 2024. And this was written 100 years ago. So this is the ether, the atmosphere. These are what were the energies that were constellating around the time that this mighty tree was born. And I want to believe that maybe in a supernatural, metaphysical way, these energies fed Me Angelina in the womb, and that perhaps Umangaliso was swimming in those possibilities, somehow understanding that there's a global African liberation movement that is at stake, and that needs to be grounded in this land currently known as South Africa. Then we come to uh, Prof's coming of age in the era of settler colonialism and some of the influences of his early conscientization. So in, by 1948, his second year at uh, Forte saw the awakening of his uh, political consciousness and there were several influences and uh, that influenced his conscientization and one of them was the study of the laws that controlled Africans, the study of the movement of people, the study of the encampment of African people in the name of Bantu administration. Now those of us who understand our history will be aware that Verfut, our other favorite Um, was the father of sociology in this country. Ne? He studied psychology. He then went to so-called Rhodesia with his parents, the missionaries. It's always the missionaries. Ever got Bible, pam, pam, pam. Right? And then he came back. And you know, the interesting thing about him was that this, dad, this, this Afrikaans nationalist was not even proper Afrikaarna. He was Dutch. So this person was actually a model migrant trying to ingratiate himself into an Afrikaarna uh, sensibility. The significance of this is that he then goes to Stellenbosch. He then becomes um, the, the, the founding faculty, head of department there after studying psychology. And then, indeed, what we now understand to be the Stellenbosch group or the Stellenbosch ideology, he then foments it. Now, I say this to say, Ma Africa, that there was nothing coincidental, incidental. This was well planned. And hence, not only did he understand the study of psychology and human behavior, he understood the study of society. So when we people say that, oh shame, they didn't understand what settler colonialism was, make no mistake, it was understood very clearly. And why? So by the time Ntate Sobukwe is engaging with this native administration, it is a template that was designed with the intent to curtail, to dehumanize, to unsee, and to remind African people on this soil, Huriluna, you are here at our behest and at our leisure. Okay. 
So indeed, Ndadesobukwe was so shocked that on one of, at one of his addresses at Fort Hare, he said this, we have chosen African nationalism because of its deep human significance, because of its inevitability and necessity to world progress. World civilization will not be complete until the African has made his full contribution, until we are seen and heard. Lekai, we are where? Here. In the space of this time, decolonization was also happening, um, and it occurred simultaneously with the emergence of the Cold War, which again had nothing to do with us. Between the Soviet Union and the United States, shame, us in the middle. And decolonization was frequently influenced by this superpower rivalry, and it had a clear effect on the development of such rivalry. It also had a profound effect on the overall landscape of international relations. So for example, you would have countries like the Soviet Union choosing to support African countries um, in their struggles to show that they were not colonizers, to show that they were better than Europeans, to show that born, they are not like those other Europeans. But in practice, there's very little difference. Now when we then, in the midst of all of that, we as an African bloc and the new independent blocs, um, countries like India and then immediately after that Pakistan, decided that we had no interest in being part of this football of so-called global powers, which were really two Western powers. Bandung, for example, the Bandung project was part of deciding that we need to have political self-determination. We need to have mutual respect for sovereignty, non-aggression, non-interference in national matters. And we bear in mind that the early sponsors of this Bandung project and the Nine Aligned movements were leaders like Nehru, were leaders like uh, Jomo Kenyatta, where leaders like, uh, you know, where leaders like the gentleman from Egypt, somebody help me? NASA. NASA. Yes. Those were the leaders that were thinking beyond these boundaried areas of being the tool of, uh, of, of Western powers. So I wonder what then, in that context, a person like Ntate Sobukwe would say about a modern day President Ruto of Kenya, choosing to be utilized to go and be a proxy soldier, tin soldier, for America's war in the Caribbean, wearing a Kaunda suit for that matter. And it is at this time when, in fact, the fascist tyranny had reached its zenith here, and African people's loyalty was being competed for. And that this Obukwe provides an answer and says, our answer, Mr. Speaker, and children of the soil, has been given by African leaders of the continent. Dr. Nkrumah has repeatedly stated that in international affairs, Africa wishes to pursue a policy of positive neutrality, allying herself to the, neither of the existing blocs, but in the words of Dr. Nandi Akizwe, Azikiwe of Nigeria, remaining independent in all things, but neutral in none that affect the destiny of Africa. What follows is what I've titled here, the moments of truth and untruths. After the National Party and our sociologist, Umverwood, gained power in 1948, uh, initiating the formalization of 300 years of colonial settler rule through the implementation of what is politely called apartheid, although it is much, much deeper. This possession is much deeper than the apartheid policies. The ANC responded to the increasing apartheid system by adopting the multiracial and proto-human rights manifesto known as the, the Freedom Charter in 1955. 
This led to criticism, as we are all aware, and disagreement from the Africanist faction within the organization. And in 1955, the great rupture from the ANC as a result of the land question emerges, being viewed as a betrayal of the big program of action. And in the Africanist, as it was said at the time, the nature of the struggle, as Sobukwe puts it, he says, for Africanists, the struggle is both nationalist and democratic in that it involves restoration of land to its rightful owners, the Africans, which fact immediately divides the combatants into the conquered and the conqueror, the invaded and the invader, the dispossessed and the dispossessor. That is a national struggle. It has nothing to do with numbers and laws, and might I add, with swimming pools and sitting on a park bench with white people. It is a fact of history, and both sides are each held together by that common history that are in the struggle, carrying out this task imposed by history. That task is for the whites, the maintenance and retention of the spoils passed on to them by the forefathers, and for the Africans, our task is the overthrow of that foreign yoke and the reclamation of the land of our fathers. So, by 1960, when in Peter Raburoko, a member of the PAC and later an advisor and a speech writer, Tuntate Kwame Nkrumah, by the way, explained the distinction between the Charter and the PAC manifesto. Um, and, and, and he stated that the Cliptown Charter of 1955 represented both black and white people, whilst the 1959 Africanist Declaration represents the African people as part of a unified African nation. Now, in all of this, the influences of Africanism on Ndate Sobukwe, including some of the people and the forces and the energies that I have already named, including Nkrumah, Kometure, and others, um, it is important to consider Sobukwe and the PAC's fundamental stance and historical context in connection with the broader advancement in anti-colonial movements. Uh, during this period, there was an increasing criticism in the 1950s and 60s of Western values, colonial influences, with a focus on what Kwame Nkrumah called African personality, what Kenneth Kaunder called humanism, what Julius Nyerere called Ujama. And African leaders and theorists were making ongoing efforts to comprehend the connection between individuals and the larger community, as well as to formulate a philosophy and philosophical anthropology of this movement. And Ndate Sobukwe's voice was key in that movement. And yet, here we are, the erasure of Ndate Sobukwe's voice, not only at that time, but seemingly in perpetuity. It is an act of commission and an act of enduring and deliberate violence. Several people and scholars, I will not name them, that would be tacky, but those who know will know. Who ought to know better and do better, continue to activate and implement the odious Sobukwe flaws related to Ndate Sobukwe's legacy by addendumizing him and his remembrance with references to whom he might have been if he had continued in the same camp as Mr. Mandela, Mr. Tambo, and Mr. Sisulu. And I say that with greatest respect for this great institution, which is named after Ndate Mandela. His intellectual achievements, life works, and significant intellectual contributions being overlooked, unknown, and indeed continually banished. So this is the sound of silence. That Ntate Sobukwe and Mezondeni Sobukwe have been rendered, named as silent, 
private, somehow unknowable, even to those who knew them and know of their work and singular life. I'd like to quote a previous speech I made on the occasion of Maison Denis' lecture to say it is not the kind of silence that comes from fear. It is not the silence that comes from being told too many times that you don't know better or that your opinions don't matter. It is a contemplative silence, an intentional silence. It is a silence where you learn about things that you don't know about. It is a silence that makes you think before you speak, and if you cannot think, it renders you unspoken. It is a silence that teaches you to respond or not react, a silence that is directed towards the interior. It is a silence that shows you that you will never speak your way into somebody's heart, mind, soul. Because there's nothing to prove where there's nothing that can be said. These are the silences of unnaming, of namelessness, false naming, renaming, omission, and lying. It is misallocation of glory or significance that belong to someone and is given to another section, sector, movement, individual. This is in line with my ongoing meditation and concern with the officializing of history and her story. The insistence that we take one path to knowing ourselves and to knowing herselves and themselves. People who have muffled people's voices and writings, some of the many ways that we have contributed and struggled to tell stories, particularly women and men in this case, um, critique literacy programs, record our histories, our histories, publish our truths, create networks, and even revise languages to meet this end. Some of the ways through which enforcement of hierarchies, media control, and anti-establishment educational policies are uh, into what I call censorship and state-led imperialist terrorism on our minds. So visibility is part of repairing our memory to see the unseen. And they are very key to my understanding of decoloniality and the necessary repair. With visibility comes remembrance. And remembrance because memory is in some sense necessary before we can address and be offered any justice for the injustices. Memory makes the past present. It makes it possible for the past to be addressed. The functionality and the flaws of memory have long been studied and documented, and yet the politics of memory with regard to the crimes committed on Ndate Sobukwe's voice are infinite. Um, and indeed, it is necessary to find a balance between this obsession with the past, and I think it is a righteous obsession and the attempts to impose forgetfulness on us. But again, the notion of silence cannot be spoken of without the coexisting silence of Ndate Sobukwe and Mezondeni Sobukwe. Their words never captured for posterity and his voice deliberately silenced. And even now we are shielded from his thoughts and bold philosophy. What have we lost by not hearing in Tatesobukwe's voice? What have we been cost? What amount of reclamation, restoration, recognition has been lost by delinking Tatesobukwe from himself and disembodying him? Because that's a very Western Eurocentric mechanism for control where knowledge can only be embedded in an individual, whereas Rona, we understand that this village, this town, this nation can carry the legacies of others. What has been lost by this vocabulary of his, of liberation, Was that his voice? <laughs> I'll forgive it. <laughs> but how indeed it plays a crucial role in what we might have known as cultural norms. 
What is the harm that has been done to us by not knowing and hearing him? What has been the harm that has been done to us by devaluing his personhood, his dignity, not only pre-1994, but post-1994? Hmm? We speak about this assumption that natives were non-human, terra nullius, empty land. Hmm? Yes. As popularized by one of my favorite people in the world, in Tatemutsukupeko, terra nullius. But even in Tate Sobukwe, is he also an empty space, devoid of meaning and banishment? Hmm? So how do we cancel these silences? We create, we reconstruct, we enforce every time we speak, we think, we look, we breathe. These memories are walking, talking. They are the shared recollection of who we are, where we have been. They are not a single stream of consciousness. And indeed, there is nothing as ugly as an instrument to enforce, to silence. That goes under the notion of officialdom. These canons remain incomplete and complicit in marginalizing and further dispossessing voices like in Tatesobukwe. What is the cost? What would it cost to fix that psychologically, spiritually, intellectually, let alone politically? And this inquiry of memory must be accompanied by an underlying discomfort that memory is going to be subjective. It is going to be chauvinistic, which is why we need many of them to contest, to meet, to dialogue with each other. It cannot be one way, this way or the highway. There must be many highways to finding ourselves because that is the ethical memory framework. And it must transfer not only political and economic power, but also the sovereignty of, econo of, of memory and African identities. And in closing, I say from Date Sobukwe and Emes Sobukwe, it requires an end to ongoing vandalism of their essence, the amputation of our collective psyche. Because for as long as they are silenced and unseen and unheard, we are not complete as a people. It renders us incomplete, it renders us incoherent, and it renders us unwhole, whether or not we are aware of this unwholeness. So I'll close with my late fav one of my other favorite people, and that is Don Matera, when he said, no dirges, let no dirges be sung, let no shrines be raised to burden his memory. Sages such as he need no tombstones to speak their fame, lay him down on a high mountain that he may look on the land that he loved, the nation for which he died. Galeboha siabonga.
Thank you so much. And thank you, um, Ms. Lebohang Peku, for your resounding words. We were in a class. This is a master class. History, her story, political science, sociology, anthropology, philosophy, giving voice, remembering erasure, cancellation of silences, dispossession, vandalism of essence, the amputation of our psyche. Thank you so much. Without further ado, I would like to ask uh, Professor Satora to come and introduce our respondent. Ladies and gentlemen, we are also honored to have in our midst Professor Sampiwe Sasante, who will be our respondent this evening, and who will reflect on the thought-provoking presentation given by our speaker. Sampiwe Sasante is a professor at the University of the Western Cape in the Faculty of Education. He's a former editor of the International Journal of African Renaissance Studies. He holds two PhDs, one in journalism studies obtained from the University of Stellenbosch and another in philosophy. <laughs> We're not going to say anything, Prof, about Stellenbosch. <laughs> and another PhD in philosophy from the University of the Witwatersrand. He has taught at Stellenbosch University's journalism department, at the Nelson Mandela University's um, department of journalism as well, media and philosophy, and at the University of South Africa's Institute for African Renaissance Studies. He has published in accredited journals on a variety of issues, including education, African philosophy, gender, journalism, politics, and spirituality. In 2018, he was awarded an NRF rating C2. Ladies and gentlemen, please let us welcome Prof. Sempiwe Sasante to the podium. and kept him alive. They are law that killed him. Let no dedges be sung, no shrines be raised to bed in his memory. Men such as he need no tombstones to lay their fame. Lay him on a high mountain so that he may look on the land he loved, the nation he died for. Men fear the fire of his soul. Igama gakama te lakshala lingwene. Igama lake lakshala lingsoni. Gokba ngum talo nga chongwai. Gokba ngum talo ngo la chwai. Sonde le kuni ke bokoko. Smu le kuni ke minyanyi. Sitis tetu se na masiku inu. Mawa ke ikaz litu. Tulani mitanji ni etu. Mokabisa okoku etu. Shaziani is known in Zet, Ozas Bassas Sizwe. They designed the film Yama Ibum in Beach, Uvele Gukai. Sneaking a maton was some blue glayo, that was the impilon net some sun. Gogba Manta Nekunya Lilin, Mustaini Kama. D. 
Yo yiga zizu la sama koma zini za kwa kinebe za kwa kuku za kwa stonga staru za kwa tukana masati za kwa wa masteni tama. Yo yiga zizu la sama chonye ni za kwa tigiza za kwa sawa za kangwa mo za kwa mtuzu melo kongwa masteni tama. Yo yiga zizu la sama chawe ni za kwa chivo za kwa kauta za kwa palo za kwa togo za kwa putamani za kwa balao za unyama na za kwa ngo siya mtu masteni tama. Yo yiga zizu la sama nda kwe ni za kwa chebele ni za kwa mintuka za kwa libele za kwa kanga she masteni tama. Yo yiga zizu ase statu ni za kwa ndebe za kwa kisa na za kwa kopo yi masteni kama. Yo yiga zizu ase ma zangwe ni za kwa kolo za kwa ngutu za kwa mlanja na za kwa soo besa za kwa ngale za wangume za kwa maliki za kwa kula za kwa nikwa ndo masteni kama. Yo yiga bo koko bam yo yiga. Yo yiga chamba ase yo yiga. Lisa msu utu yo yiga izangwa mfelwe ni yo yiga. Tikela nindol mele zela matolo wa maya keve zela masteni kama. Master Maxim, Master Nitama, Comrade Diabolo, I'm afraid. I'm literally afraid, and my throat is getting dry. I'm literally afraid. I was trained as a journalist, Comrade Diabolo. Now, in journalism, one of the things that we are told, taught is note-taking. So I should be very efficient in note-taking. But today I wasn't able to do so because we came up with so many issues, I became confused. And that's why I'm so much afraid. But I've asked the ancestors, I've invoked them, and I've asked them to give me the necessary strength. The revolutionary greetings made them be seen together with all the VCs and the program directors and all the leadership that is here with us today. And Comrade Diepolo is raising a very important question, that being that where would we be? What is it that we have lost? What is it that we still need to, re to reclaim? And having said that, Comrade Diepolo, let me perhaps begin at the beginning, because if I do not begin at the beginning, I'm going to be lost. A number of years ago, it may have been two or three, I do not quite recall, but I had a, a conversation with Comrade Alan Zinn this morning just to make sure that I'm not off the track. We need to, to put history in its context, and that being that the fact that we are here today was through a persistent action by a woman who was leading in the Eastern Cape or perhaps in the Nelson Mandela region. This lecture has not always been there. But Comrade Kosi Maketuk visited the office of Comrade Alan Zin and kept on knocking persistently until this lecture became a reality. Now I know that many in this, in this uh, audience here often quote Franz Fanon. And when they quote Franz Fanon, inevitably they say that every generation has got a mission to discover. It is up to that generation to betray or to fulfill that mission. That is always that you will get from the comrades and nothing else from Franz Fanon. As if that is all that Franz Fanon ever said. But Franz Fanon has said many things and things that are significant. One of the things that Franz Fanon has taught us is that it is very important to acknowledge those who came before us. We should not ever pretend that everything began with us. We stand tall today because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And that was one of the things that we must remember about Franz Fanon. And I'm speaking directly to the point that you're making, Comrade Diapolo, about memory. What is it that we remember? And what is it that we choose to forget? It is very significant. It was by no accident of history. This is the second memorial lecture of Mangali Sosobukwe at the Nelson Mandela University. It is. The second, the first speaker, and this is very significant, was Comrade Christine Kunda. Christine Kunda was, as we should know, a woman. 
The initiator of this public lecture is or was a woman. The first person who delivered it was a woman. And the second person, without any interruption in between, is a woman. And that is telling us something about what the ancestors beyond the grave are telling us. That women, as they always have done, historically in Africa, must lead. Because men have messed up. And I am a man. As they come. But men have learned very well from their European masters. In Europe, as you would read from the, from the book written by Aristotle, The Politics, women were not regarded as citizens. Women and slaves were regarded as properties who could not think, and only men were citizens. And therefore, patriarchy is a heritage of Europe that was imposed upon the African people. Patriarchy has got nothing to do with Africa and everything to do with Europe. And it is for that reason that, Comrade dear Paul, you are here today, and before you, there was Comrade Christine, and the one who initiated all of this was Comrade Makmaketuka Kosi, so that, therefore, men must begin to listen. And what is it that men learned from their European masters? And here we are going to speak about memory. They learned a lot of things. One of the things that they learned was that uh, when the European colonialists took the Africans from here to the Americas, one of the first things that they did was to rape African women, to devalue them, to humiliate them. As if that was not enough, they took African men to rape their women, thus to devalue them so that they could produce children, reproduce children of rape. And today, African men continue to rape African women. Even those that claim to be pan-Africanists, they rape African women by marginalizing African women and not giving the necessary recognition to women and accepting them as leaders that they should be. How is it that in this movement of Mangaliso Sobu that taught us in the conduct of this organization that African women must be treated with dignity and respect? How is it that at no stage do we hear a significant conversation about the leadership of women? How does that happen? It is meant that we speak the truth while we are still alive. That was Mangaliso Sobukwe saying that. Sobukwe told us that we must be frank and he said to us, when he said that leaders in front you know, many of us have got a very mistaken notion of thinking that we are the liberators of the masses. Because of that mistaken notion, we have an illusion that we know it all. We think that we are the liberators and that the masses will follow us. And yet, Mangali Sosobuke told us that it is the masses themselves 
who are going to liberate them. It was Mangali Susubu who said this. And so these are the things that you remind me of today, Comrade Diepo. I came here afraid, but as I'm beginning to remember Mangali Susubu, I'm gaining some strength and Diabulel Kuchambas. Leaders in front, Mangaliso Sobuke told us, the concept of leadership in front in particular means that we or you, the leaders, are supposed to be the one who learn first. You cannot give what you do not have. You cannot educate without learning. And many of us told Karl Marx, Mawazi Tung, and everyone else. But were we to be challenged to speak about the PAC case that Mangali Sosobuke articulated? Were we are, are, are challenged to speak about the speech that he delivered, the inaugural speech? We are not able to deliver because we respected others and devalued ourselves. We sing of the ancestors of others and not about our own ancestors. And so therefore what this tells us is that the status campaign that was begun by the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania in 1959-1960 ended with the Sobukwes and was not carried on by and with the next generation. And that is why we are in the mess that we are today. And what is that mess? Mangali Sosobukwe taught that the liberatory creed is African nationalism. But that African nationalism which is on a pan-African basis. He told us that South Africa is no exception but an integral part of the African continent. And that all African people are one nation. But what has happened to us? We hear even those who are Pan-Africanists. When they speak about fellow Africans, they refer to them as foreign nationals. How can it be that an African in Africa would ever be regarded as a foreigner? And those are the things that come to memory today, Comrade Diepon. And so then what happens? Mangali Sosobuko at the very age of 25, he says to us, let me plead with you, lovers of my Africa, to carry with you into the world a vision of a new Africa. An Africa reborn, an Africa rejuvenated, an Africa recreated, young Africa. Africa shall not retreat, Africa shall not equivocate, Africa shall not retrend, relent, remember Africa. And at that inaugural conference of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, Mangaliso Sobuko was saying, no, it was at Forte that he was saying this. He was saying that the student nurses were not with them, those women, on that day, because they were busy involved in a struggle. He said to us that Africa does not forget. And so it is appropriate that you marry memory and forgetfulness together because it was Bangali Sosobukwe himself that instructed us to remember. And if then we do remember, Comrade Diepolo, I heard you mentioning in passing, and this is a fact that is not appreciated by, by many of us, that we often speak about Sylvester Williams or W.D. War as the fathers of Pan-Africanism. And yet the truth of the matter is that Alice Kinlock, whom you mentioned, was the one who inculcated the idea 
into the head of Sylvester Williams. She it was that then the African Association was established so that we could have the first Pan-African Conference in 1900. Women were leading at that time. It was Amy Garvey at that crucial significant conference, the Manchester Conference in 1945, who was chairing the first chess session. The women were leading. Our ancestors have taught us in our own languages. That is because, you see, Comrade dear Paul, when these people came, one of the things that they did to the African-Americans was to rob them of their African languages. But even as we remain, us, with our own African languages, we have learned nothing. We are learning nothing. We know that one of the most important things in African culture, bububele, ubuntu, to be kind and hospitable to the wayfarers. But what are we doing? We are ravaging our own brothers and sisters who are coming from outside because we are afraid to confront the real issue. Our land has been taken from us because we're afraid of the masters. We're busy running around formulating policies about how to block our own African brothers and sisters who are running away from poverty and persecution. We are saying we must deal with them and deal with them now. Sitting side by side with those who took away our land. We call them our brothers and sisters. We kill those who look our eyes because we regard them as enemies. But let us remember. And comrade dear Paul, we are looking up to the sisters because African culture as creation has given them that responsibility that we know that the word ububele comes from the word amabele <laughs> amabele give milk women are the first women are the first providers. They give. Women are the first protectors of all human beings. Women are the first teachers of all human beings. My sisters, men, like any oppressors in the world, Mangali Sosobuke said that, we are not expecting any miracles to take place. Yes. White oppressors will not voluntarily step down from power. Historically, oppressors have always been forced to, to do so. It is not through the negotiations, the begging of men, trying to get them to understand that you must lead, that you will lead. You've got to take the bull by its horns. The saying in Hawthorne says, one minute left, that the penis scatters and the womb gathers. Literally, the penis scatters and the womb literally gathers. Men through their ego are raping, killing, literary and otherwise. It is the women who will respond to Mangali Sosobukwe's call and take the necessary leadership forward. <laughs>